And this is the judgment, that the truth has come into the world and we loved our illusions more. In God, there is truth. In God, there is no falseness at all. For God came in Jesus not to condemn the world, but to restore the world. Beloved community, welcome to this evening's Maundy Thursday service. It is a deeply felt service of word, music, and communion as we descend into shadow, remembering Jesus' final journey to the cross. Let us take our time as we remember the final hours of Jesus' life and allow our grief and anguish to mingle with his. Tonight, we trust our worship to lead us through life and into death, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let us worship together, beginning with our opening hymn, Ah, Holy Jesus, please rise in body or in spirit.
Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 4. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For the servant grew up before God like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we would look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Reading from one moment. A reading from John. Chapter 13, 3 through 14. During the supper, Jesus, knowing that God was given all things into his hands, and he came from the God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. After he had washed their feet, he had put and put his robe on. He returned to the table. Jesus said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You called me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet.
A reading from Matthew chapter 27, verses 49 through 51. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again and with a loud voice and breathed his, his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. Watching beings from whom for whom I loved and cared take their last breath didn't rock the world, but it rocked my world. Lucille May, Denniston, Wilson Harrington, the white great-grandmother who raised me, was slipping away. Her breaths became more shallow. Her deep love for me, which forced her to confront her own family's racism and whiteness, made hearing her breathing become labored. Forced me to confront an earth-shattering reality. She was leaving me. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all those who loved him probably struggled with that reality. They would discover, though, in three days that Jesus would never leave them or forsake them. It took me more than three days to realize that the strong woman taken by Alzheimer's bit by bit was really a spirit trapped in a decaying temple. A decaying relationship and closed doors led me to a fount of unconditional love. Another fount of unconditional love, a 10-year-old Weimaraner named Riley. He was with me when I began the seminary journey where at Chicago Theological Seminary, I was what they say, destructed to be reconstructed. He had a big heart. Sadly, his heart was too big. I was there for his last breath. In that moment, it felt as though the void could never be filled. But God blessed me with a seminary family, including my seminary sister, Reverend Deidre Jackson Jones. She was a strong black woman who taught me so much about being fabulously authentic. She too had a big heart, a heart that couldn't handle her. So I found myself beside her bedside near the end. I began this past March celebrating my 46th year by eating Mexican food with a dying friend named Jose Luis Sanchez. I say his name because he lived with the fear no one would remember him. He was a handsome and intelligent man. Our last conversation would include critiquing Henry Louis Gates, finding your roots, and orchestrating how he could listen to the 1619 Project as cancer took his strength to hold a book. He took some of his last breaths during my next visit. Despite being in between destinations, his eyes popped open when I leaned down and thanked him for being a friend. Grandma, Riley, Deidre, and Jose Luis left human-shaped voids. Jesus himself left a human-shaped void. However, while we bury our loved ones' temples, a different version of them lives on. Grandma Riley, Deidre, and Jose, Jose Luis's spirits continue walking with me. An anecdote that just sticks in my mind, Deidre's sar sarcastic spirit, for example, scolded me for letting mourning her get in the way for enjoying some eye candy. 
those who've lost, those who you have lost, continue walking with you. And Jesus continues walking with us, even after the last breath. A reading from John chapter 13, verses 34 through 38, the new commandment. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow afterward. Peter said, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Scripture reading, John 18, verses 1 through 5 and 10 to 11. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judah, Judas, who, was, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. I, am I not to drink the cup that God has given me? It is a privilege to be with each and every one of you this evening. I wonder how the mood may have shifted when Jesus entered the dining room for what was to be the Last Supper. Surely that evening, the disciples must have arrived with different expectations for how the night would play out. Maybe some disciples were eager for a hearty meal after a long day of ministering to the community. Others maybe were just excited to enjoy the fellowship to be among their friends. And maybe one or two arrived feeling a little depleted. Maybe they were having questions about dedicating their entire lives to follow Jesus. Where was it going? Was it worth it, considering all that they had to give up? For the journey had been tiring, both physically and spiritually, and they hoped that the dinner would provide them with a moment of renewal, a moment of renewal to rekindle the spark of their calling. So when Jesus arrives, he upends all these expectations, for he immediately turns to his friends and says, truly tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples respond with a deep sense of grief. They appear gutted when they hear that among them was a traitor. They are also shocked. Shocked because they had assumed that they were all united, all on the same page doing whatever they could to follow Jesus and to support one another. They were the 12 disciples 
kind of like the three amigos, united in purpose, together in siblinghood, bound by a commitment to follow Jesus wholly. And suddenly that image of who they were and how they saw themselves was shattered. They began to ask, what happened? What went wrong? What signs did I miss? The scriptures tell us that the disciples immediately responded to Jesus saying, surely not I, teacher. And while the scriptures later point to the specific betrayal by Judas that led to Jesus' crucifixion, I suspect that all the disciples reflected on ways they could have done more to protect Jesus. Maybe they thought about times when they were tired and their faith was weak, or when they didn't carry through on the instinct to check upon their fellow disciples to make sure that they were okay. Maybe they just assumed that following Jesus, sure, it was going to be hard, but it would never require the heartbreak of seeing Jesus being sent to be crucified. During this time of my life, I often tell myself, I'm doing the best I can. I'm certainly busy as a minister, a partner to Lauren, as a little league coach, a parent to the boys, as a son, a son-in-law and nephew, to parents and aunt and uncle who all live far away. My plate is very full. And like the disciples, I often come to the table hungry, eager for fellowship, and in need for renewal. However, I also come to the table with doubts. Have I made the right choices? Is what I'm doing responsible? Am I doing enough? What else should I be doing to tend to these relationships and responsibilities? Are people in the congregation feeling connected Will Sunday school fill up in the CE suite like it used to? Are my loved ones feeling heard and valued even when I'm often tired and grumpy, especially in the morning? What blinders are on that are preventing me from seeing things the way they are, not just the way I want them to be? Maybe some of you can relate to this. So late at night, I often wonder if saying I'm doing the best I can is just an easy way for me to turn away from these questions, praying for the best. And maybe I need to listen a bit more deeply to God to figure out what changes, small or big, I can make to better honor all that I'm called to do. So friends, in times when there is so much brokenness in the world, including wars and racism and climate change, it is not unreasonable for God to tell us that one of you betrayed me. But it may be unreasonable for us to respond, it is not I, Lord. So as we prepare to join Christ at the table, let us both receive the grace that only God can provide, but let us also recommit ourselves in tangible ways to better serve God and to love neighbor. Amen.
I sort of feel like I should have paid admission for that. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Mary. Friends, the tables we set this evening are for all who wish to know the presence of God and share in the community of the body of Christ. We remember that when Jesus broke the bread and poured the cup among those gathered was one who would doubt him, one who would deny him, one who would betray him. They would all leave him alone before the night was over, and he knew it. Still, Jesus ate with them. If he ate with them, surely God is ready to eat with us. All we must be is hungry. God will do the rest. So will you pray with me? Merciful God, we gather in this evening hour as friends gathered with Jesus long ago. We come bearing the marks of a bitter and broken world. We come with parched spirits and lungs gasping for the breath of life. Remind us in the breaking of bread of our need and your sufficiency. Refresh us with a cup of forgiveness as the night closes in and deepen in us the power of your steadfast love in Jesus Christ. As together we pray the prayer he taught the disciples, saying, Our God, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Tonight as we break the bread, I invite those joining us by Zoom to turn on your video cameras and view the service in gallery mode so that we can lift the bread and cup together and witness the power of celebrating communion as one body. When Jesus knew that the hour had come, he gathered with his friends for a meal. Getting up from the table, he tied a towel around his waist and washed their feet as a servant. He said, do as I have done. He returned to the table and continued the meal by taking bread. And I invite those at home to take your bread now and lift it. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it even to Judas, saying, I am the bread of life. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and I invite you to take your cup. And he raised the cup, giving thanks to God, saying, I am the true vine. Drink the cup in remembrance of me. And he gave them a new commandment, saying, Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if we love one another. Gracious God, Grant that all who share the communion of the bread and cup may be one. Send your Holy Spirit on all our tables of bread and wine and on us. Be present with us now as we share this meal. Amen. Beloved community, we now invite those in the sanctuary to form a wide circle. We will come around with gluten-free bread and cup, and as you receive it, take and eat.
Let us pray. Gracious God, may your presence among us provoke such longing for your realm that we will never be satisfied until the whole earth knows of your justice and peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 17 through 18, and 25 through 27. Peter denies Jesus. The woman who guarded the gate said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. ...of the crucifixion, also from the Gospel of John. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others one on either side, with Jesus between them. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, 
he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The burial of Jesus, as told in the Gospel of John, also in the 19th chapter. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of, of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the palace, and the, now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was a Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Plea for Deliverance, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance, from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were freed, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. It was you who drew me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my being. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. In the dust of death you lay me down, for dogs are all around me. A conclave of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all of my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Saving God, be not far away. Oh, help, come quickly to my aid. Friends, will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, one of us betrayed you, another denied you, and all of us have forsaken you. Yet you remain faithful to us, unto death, even death on a cross. Strengthen us so we do not turn aside, but stay awake. Amen. As I remove the Christ light from the, camp, from the sanctuary, let us depart from this service into the silence of this holy night. 